invitation as we come to the Lord's table this morning. Uh, we turn to the uh, New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 2, the first three verses, where we believe it was the Apostle Paul who wrote, So we must listen very carefully to the truth we heard, or we may drift away from it. Have you ever drifted away from something you know to be true? Yeah. Have you ever just kind of uh, put them on the back burner and somehow it didn't seem so important as you walk through life? Um, that's what Paul is talking about here when he talks about the truth that they've heard. He's talking about the truth of the gospel, talking about the truth of who Jesus is. He said, we must listen very carefully to that truth that we've heard, or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm, and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak? If your doctor is like mine, there are always tests, aren't there? Tests with bodily fluids, machines. My doctor tests by thumping my chest, my knees, and anything else he's curious about. There are lots of tests when you go to the doctor. Reason, I'm told, for these tests are for developing a baseline. The doctor wants to see where you are normally. You know, not everybody has blood pressure that's 120 over 80. Can I get an amen? Amen. Uh, Sounds like, you know, there's an epidemic in here, isn't it? Um, some people naturally have higher blood pressure and some lower. My mother was one of those people who had low blood pressure. Um, some people have low, some people have high. Few are constantly perfect at 120 over 80, but that's the target. It's the best way, says the experts, for a heart to operate is at 120 on the top number and 80 on the bottom number. And when I go to the doctor, if after all the tests that he gives me, he tells me that I'm sick, he will start writing on the pad in Latin so that I can understand it. And it's understood that if I really want the sickness to go away, I'd better follow through and take my medication. Now, at the risk of offending the theological correctness police here, I want to say that my doctor is just like Jesus, very annoying. What do I mean by that? Well, often because of the expense of getting better or the trouble involved in getting better, I would much rather just ignore my illness until it becomes something I can't ignore anymore. Have you been there? Uh, you know, we, we hate when I go to the doctor, he says, how are you feeling? I say, that's for me to know and you find out. You know? <laughs> You're the expert. Do it if you can. But my doctor won't let me do that. He gets in my face and he says, either with words or just a stare, do you really want to be well? That's so much like Jesus. Jesus says to us, do you really want to be well? Or would you rather lapse away would you rather drift away from being healthy? You know, historic Methodist doctrine. We dropped the United off there for a second. Just call us Methodist, you know. We go back way before uh, any of us knew anything or anything uh, our parents maybe have known. Let's just say Methodist this morning. Historic Methodist doctrine says that it is possible to drift away from our salvation. It's possible to sin away God's work of grace in us. What that means is that Wesleyan people are not part of a once saved, always saved crowd. You can get that down at the local Calvinist doctrine leading churches where it's once saved, always saved. But here, there's free will both in coming to Christ or in turning your back on Him in backslidden sinfulness. Can you walk away from your salvation? Well, according to historical Methodist doctrine, 
And in keeping with that doctrine, the very idea of drifting away from the truth should scare the eternal fool out of all of us. If even, Paul writes, if even the angels who disobeyed were punished for drifting away from complete obedience to God, and they are lumped in with such nefarious immorality as Sodom and Gomorrah, how could you and I not be overwhelmingly mortified to be lumped in with that group? Now, some people might be quick to say, oh, but Russell, the, the grace of God. Certainly. Of course, the grace of God is the Father's way of restoring us to right relationship with Him. I have no argument there. I preach that. But a right relationship with God is only right when it is a holy relationship. Did you realize even a Christian who is steeped in the depth of sin God turns his back on us. When we refuse to confess our sin, when we refuse to own our sin, when we refuse to repent of our sin, how many prayers does God hear when we lift them up? Can you do this? Can you make a zero with me? Can you make a goose egg? When we're in sin, except we confess that sin, that's the only prayer he hears, is the confession of our sin. That relationship can only be right when it is holy. Grace only works when it is received and acted upon. The grace of God will forgive our sins. That is what 1 John tells us, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But listen, when we, re when we hold on to those sins, when we won't let them go, when we won't lay them at the foot of the cross, when we will not repent of them, and ask with God's help that we will do those sins no more. It is merely words echoing in the air. Forgiveness extended requires and demands a keeping of the relationship right. And that keeping requires constant monitoring of our behavior and our confession of sins to keep moving in the direction of growing as a believer. Did you know that you're either growing or withering away. There's no such thing as a middle ground. There's no just holding on. I, you know, I, I always think about the illustration the preacher gave a hundred million years ago, it seems, about the lady who was asked by her preacher, and how are you doing? And how is it with your soul? And she said, oh, thank God I'm holding on. There's not a question of holding on. It's a question of giving in. It's a question of confessing and letting God hold you. We don't hold on to Him as much as He holds us up. But He will not hold us up if we will hold on to our sins. It is a one or the other deal. This is a corollary to the works and faith conundrum that we hear about. We don't do good works like helping people and praying and attending church and tithing and witnessing. We don't do things like that to get saved. No, that's a matter of faith. However, a faith that brings on salvation as the gift of God will always lead the person who is saved into good works. We don't do good works to get saved, but once we are saved, that salvation will lead us into good works. We walk by faith, which, if we're being obedient to our Father's will, results in good works. James, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, laid that out for us in his letter, James chapter 2. Listen to these few words. James says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, Goodbye. Have a good day, stay warm, eat well. But you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? James says, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. Now some may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. 
So it's never a matter of knowing all the right stuff about God and what's right or wrong if we're not going to put that stuff to work doing the things of God, what God has commanded. And therein lies the key to living the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ. It is less about talking the talk than it is about, say it with me, class, walking the walk. Mark Twain, by all accounts, was a deist. It means that he believed that there is a God, but Mark Twain was not a follower of Jesus Christ. And he once said this, though, and I like this statement. He said, I don't worry so much about what I don't understand in the Bible as I worry about the things I do understand and don't do. And that's the forgiveness baseline. That's the point at which we check our faith pulse. Did you realize that just like your biological pulse, that you can check how good the heart is doing, we have a faith pulse to see if we're really walking the walk of doing what we have uh, what we've had made clear to our hearts about following Jesus. Or if we're just talking the good talk about following Jesus. We come to this table this morning to touch base with that baseline. To take our spiritual pulse, if you will. That's what this table is all about. How we are doing with keeping that relationship holy and right. We come close to what Christ has done for us so that we check it against what our faith pulse is really doing. This is one of the reasons that our longer liturgy actually is so important. It's kind of like a checklist. In the longer liturgy, which we're going to use this morning in just a moment or two, we do several things. We are asked to examine ourselves. And so we examine ourselves. We examine our life. We take our pulse, if you will, about how we're doing with God. We clear our hearts with other believers. In confession, we confess our sins and we receive forgiveness and we offer forgiveness to others. You remember in the liturgy where the preacher says at the end of a time of silent prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven? What does the congregation say back to the preacher? In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. You see, we offer and receive forgiveness with others. We confess our faith and our dependence on Christ. And all of this frees us for obedience and service in God's kingdom. We take our medicine, if you will, and we watch our test levels return to the baseline, to the place where it ought to be, forgiven, healthy, and useful. That is what we come to the table for this morning. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let it be so in our lives.